Luke chapter 13. And it is a new year. Take a while to get used to writing 2023 instead of 2022. But uh, after a while you get used to it. But I'm going to look at Luke chapter 13 and about the first uh, nine verses. And it divides up really into two sections and then well, I got another place I want to go and then I'll I guess if I got a new year's resolution, I want to preach better this year. I think I need to do that thing that called KISS. K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. And <laughs> that's the other one. <laughs> I, try to get, I try to put two or three sermons in one. That's why I end up going so long. And Carol says I chase rabbits. And that my big faults. So this morning I'm going to try to do better. But we're going to look at Luke chapter 13. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come. I pray that you'll be with me as I try to preach, and especially uh, through this next year. And also pray for Manny, Lord, with the moving his schedule around. And, and pray for Julie trying to take care of all three girls. Be with Patty, Lord, with Joe and Jeremy and the problems they're having. And well, we just pray for all of our people, Lord. You know the needs better than we do. We just put our people in your hands. They're in your hands anyway, but a lot of times we can't do much, but you can do things we can't even think of or imagine. Or So we trust you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 16, or 13, verse 1. There were present at that season, some of the, that told him in Galilee, the, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. So here's some of these Jewish people making sacrifice and government's killing them. Their blood's getting mingled with their sacrifices' bloods. That's, that's kind of tragic, isn't it? Wouldn't that be tragic? Well, it'd be like to come in here and kill all of us in church. Well, that's about what it come down to. And uh, I think somebody, if you listen to Manny's message this morning, that might come. It will sooner or later. It will later. I know that's going to happen. Amen. Once the Antichrist comes along. Verse 2. And Jesus answered. Now, seeing it's going to turn red here. That means Jesus is doing the talking. He gives them this little parable. Well, he tells them about these tragedies. And then the next thing, he gives them a parable of the, of the fig tree. And Jesus said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Boy, they must be great sinners. They got killed. Tragic death. Verse 3. I tell you, nay. No. Not necessarily. Nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. People need to repent. Amen. You know, we got a lot of people that they think they can be a Christian and not repent. You can't be a Christian unless you're sorry for your sins. You need to be sorry that you're a sinner. Right. And ask God to forgive you and mean it. Of course, nowadays it's hard to find a sinner. Nobody sins. Yeah. They're all victims. Right. Either, either you're a perpetrator or a victim. All the white people are perpetrators picking on all the minority groups but I don't believe that's true I think I could say like Jesus nay yeah. you know but there are some white people that do things like that and they're terrible people and uh, you know I always used to get, years ago thought all racism was one direction all white to blacks are white to minorities I found out working in Coke that wasn't true. Some of the black people hated white people. Matter of fact, I worked with a fellow who was a preacher, and he told me, he said he'd go around when he was a teenager and a bunch of his teenage buddies beating white people up. In Detroit, Michigan, had to leave Detroit, come down here, 
and lived with his sister that worked in the post office. And his dad was a, a preacher up in, he was more than a preacher, he was over a whole uh, group of uh, churches. He says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Are those 18, are those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye they, that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you nay. You can have a tragic death and not be a great sinner. Right. Something can just happen. Isn't that right? You can get in an automobile accident. Sinners and non-sinners get in automobile accident. Then verse 5 says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now twice he said repent. I think some people need to, I think we probably all need to repent. Amen. And I, 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 you know, I don't have a list of all your sins. Dr. McGee got a list of, I think he said he heard this guy got a list of five or six hundred <coughs> sins. Everybody was right and want the list. They're afraid they were missing out on something. Because a lot of people think sin's fun. A <coughs> sin might start out fun, but it doesn't end up fun. Isn't that the way it works a lot of times? But he says twice to repent. What he's talking, you know, a tragic death can happen to anyone. <coughs> Can it? And uh, not a, sin, a sign. Of, it's not a sign of righteousness or unrighteousness. But some people like to say, "What'd you do to?" Isn't that what they did to the Job back in the Old Testament? What do you do, Job, to bring all these problems on yourself? Uh, one fellow that Jesus healed in the New Testament. I think he was blind from birth. Uh, is it John nine? Some, and he said, and then Jesus told him, said he didn't sin nor his parents. Well, maybe his parents did something bad and that brought it on him. No, that's not so either. Not necessarily. You know what? We're not the judge of these things. God is. Amen. God's in control. Only God's grace causes us to be able to live. You're living by God's grace. If God decided He didn't want to have you live anymore, you wouldn't be living. If you got this last year in, it was God's grace. Some tragedy could have happened to you this last year and snuffed your life out. Is it that true or not? But we've got to be careful about uh, how we look at some of these things. Now we're down here at verse 6. Uh, he spake also this parable. <coughs> a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And so he's, it usually takes about three years for a fig tree to get fruit on it. That's what they say. And, uh, but he goes and he finds it. And sometimes they would get leaves on it but not have fruit. Well, the leaves are supposed to say that it has fruit. And Jesus uh, had another parable about a fig tree in another place in the Bible like that. Wow. And he put a curse on the tree and it died. And of course, in that case, it was talked about the nation of Israel. This one I don't think necessarily is just talking about the nation of Israel. But uh, you're a tree, I guess, you know. I was asking Manny the other day, I went back and found out where the trees talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah, Do you know that's in the Bible, trees talking to each other? There's all kinds of things in the Bible. Verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why cumberest it the ground? Why, why let it live? I've checked it for three years. Didn't, didn't produce anything. Just, let's cut it, cut it down. Well, has the Lord let you go three years? What have you produced? If God decided to, could He cut you down? Could He allow you to be cut down? Yeah. But, let's read on here. You've got somebody that watches over the, the trees here. Verse 8, And He answered and said unto him, Lord, let it uh, alone this year 
also till I shall dig about it and dung it. Well, I get it now. Joe's mother was pretty good with plants. Carol says if she touches a plant, it dies. <laughs> and, uh, but she could get stuff to grow, couldn't she, Joe? Uh -huh. But sometimes, and she took care of this flower box out here a lot. Of course, not there now, but it was there for years. And she'd put Miracle Girl on it. And she'd go and break off the dead stuff on the plants. I asked Carol, why do you do that? Well, because all that zaps the energy from the plant. And, uh, but here this tree isn't produced, hadn't produced in three years. And uh, uh, God said, uh, just shut, kill the thing, get rid of it. I'm not doing anything. And so he says in verse eight, and he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. Let me work on a little more. Thank God's going to let the Holy Spirit work on you a little more. Will you let the Word of God work on you a little more? Do you need any more work or are you really producing? Uh huh. I know I could produce more. Anybody here think they could produce more? Could you do a little more for the Lord? Well, I think probably all of us could. But anyway, verse 9. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. I guess if I had a uh, message here this morning, and verses 6 through 9 is talking about the fig tree, and uh, it's got to show signs of life. Do you think if somebody says they're saved, they ought to show some signs of life? Amen. Well, faith without works is what? Yeah. You're not doing much for God. You're not showing much life. Of course, at least you're all here in church this morning starting the year out good. Amen. Anybody bring their Bible? How many brought their Bible? Of course, if you come to Bible Baptist, we might look down on you if you don't. But you know, some churches, they'll look at you funny if you bring one. Now, there's something wrong with that, I think. Because that's my authority. It's God's Word. It's not the denomination. It's not, uh, you know, the majority rule or anything but in verses 9 uh, 6 through 9 he uh, shows signs of life or take uh, three years to cut it cut it down or uh, one we're we going to give it one more year what did he give it let's give it another year that's what he said there in verse 9 and if it bear fruit well and if not then after that thou shalt cut it down after another year Go ahead, Lord, give you another year. You ought to be thankful if he's given. Did he get you through this last year? Yeah. Yes, sir. Now you're starting in the new year. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to do the same thing with this year that you did with the one you had last year? Or maybe you could step up a little bit. Uh-huh. Maybe we could do a little more. Could we try to do just a little bit more? And if all of us would do a little bit more, church would really prosper you know one or two people can't do it all I'm thankful for different ones that come and clean the building Manny helps me with the preaching some of you help take the offerings there's all kinds of thin little jobs that people can have Edward goes with me and we we'll go out to the commons and talk to people and Manny goes up on the street corner and I know a lot of you try to witness to people even timber witnesses to people. What well, wasn't out there at the commons and people come up to see timber and care and say, here, here's your track. Timber just give you a track, right? Well, somebody says, well, he can't hand somebody a track. But I think he attracted people over there, give Karen an opportunity to give them a track. Would you think that's a good thing or not? So we need to have some visible change. And, uh, you know, we must be some, some kind of life in, in each of us. And, and we say we're saved. There should be some life there. Uh, if, we claim to, if we claim salvation, there should be some life. Are you claiming to be a Christian? Then there will be some life. You know, the big question isn't... Uh, uh, 
why do people die in a tragic way? That's not the big question. Although well, that's what you always hear on the news. Some young guy gets shot down in Indianapolis and, uh, or some woman uh, gets kidnapped. Two little twin baby boys got kidnapped. The woman stole the car. And they found one, I think, over in Ohio and one here in Indianapolis. But they got them both back right before Christmas and the families were real thrilled about that. They ought to be. Because they could, those babies, they were just little bitty boys and they could have been dead. Matter of fact, that last one they found in the car abandoned. Thankfully it wasn't down below zero. Thankful for the warm spell. God, I think, probably was watching over that little baby. Don't you imagine that's the case? God thought, well, it's not time for that one to die. And why do people die isn't such, and tragic uh, isn't really the big question. You know what the big question is? I'm going to give you the big question. Here's the big question. But why does God keep me alive? Why are you here? What's God want? Does God want anything from you? Uh -huh. Well, I think that's the big question, don't you? Why am I even here? Why has the Lord let me live for 76 years? My brother's dead. My mother's dead. My dad's dead. And about a year or so, a couple years ago, I thought my wife was going to be dead. I sure thought it sure looked like it to me. She's down there gasping for air in the hospital. And those leads come loose on, the, on her pacemaker. And they were about ready to start beating you in the chest what, one day after they'd cut you open and, and uh, wired you back together. You're only here because God lets you be here. But the big question is, am I really worth it? Are you worth God sparing you for another year? Has God got any plans for you? You have, well, of course, you know you don't have to. You don't have to do anything for God. God doesn't make you do anything. He made you with a free will. And sorry to say, most people that. Their free will doesn't have any room for God. Isn't that the truth or not? And a lot of Christians have very little room for God. Oh, there's a little life. Oh, I guess there's a little spark of goodness in all of us. Well, that's what some to say. But I, I'll tell you what, it's hard to find it in some people. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Now I'm being mean. Yesterday's a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Today is the only cash I have. So invest it wisely. And I think you are. You're in church. Amen. Do you think God wants you in church this morning? Yes. But a lot of people say they're Christians, but they don't see that there's, there's really, they don't even think there's any reason to go to church. After all, I can stay home and watch the TV preacher. I can listen to all the sermons I want to. I think Casey we used to be into that, and then the guy says, Casey, you need to get in a church. He didn't call Casey's name, but <laughs> the Lord called Casey's name. And that what happened? Or am I making that up? From what you kind of told me, that's the kind of the way I think it worked. As he was watching this preacher, and the preacher said, you ought to find you a church. And Casey got to thinking about, well, maybe I ought to find me a church. And somehow he dropped in this place. <laughs> How'd you even find it? You, on the internet, I'm sure. That's how everybody finds us anymore. Google Maps. Google Maps. <laughs> he said, well, that, well, that church is in a weird place. <laughs> Did you have trouble finding it the first time? Uh, I thought it was funny that I'd lived in Noblesville for a while and I drove past it all the time and didn't even hardly know it was back here. Yeah. Well, we need to do something about that. We should fix it so people can't drive by and not know we're here. 
Well, we did put a sign down on the river. You think anybody notices that sign? Apparently somebody does, they've been ripping it down. Well, we've been putting it back up. Should we keep putting it up? Amen. Matter of fact, this summer I want to get one underneath the Jesus Saves says Bible Baptist Church visitors welcome back up there. I also want to get a bigger sign down here on the side of the road. I want it to be white with red letters. I want it to be bigger than it is now so they can see it on out so they won't go around the curve and miss us. Those little realty signs, we put those down there hoping they'd help, but sometimes they don't. Uh, Karen invited a lady, and she said she looked for us for, what, two or three weeks? Finally, she showed up, but she never did come back, so I don't know. But at least we ought to do what we can to let people know we're here and to tell them about Jesus. Like I say yesterday, you can't go back and redo that. You can't do tomorrow's stuff today. You can only do what you can do today. And so let's let's do that. And uh, now we're going to go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, there's a t verses 12 through 16 I want to read. These will be real familiar verses to you. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Now as though I had already attained. Now Paul's talking to this church at Philippi and uh, he says, I, I haven't arrived yet. I think Paul was a fairly successful Christian. Mm -hmm. Do you think he was a very successful Christian? We well, wrote over half the New Testament and started a whole bunch of churches, didn't he? While he was making tents. And a, a lot of the churches that he started didn't even support him. And he just went on anyway. And I, now Manny seems to think that maybe he's that guy that, uh, uh, the rich young ruler. And I could see that, but I don't know. Maybe Paul was rich and then when he quit being in a, a Pharisee, then he lost a lot. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't agree or disagree with Manny. I've thought about it. I've read it. Could be Paul. Could be a lot of people. Right. But anyway, we're looking at uh, verse uh, 12 here. Now, as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. He said, I haven't re reached a maturity yet. I'm, I'm still working on being a better Christian. I don't care if you've been <coughs> saved for 50, 60 years. You can still be a better Christian. Amen. You'll never reach perfect in, in this life. There's no such a thing in this life as sinless perfection, although there are some churches that teach it, but they falsely teach it. Now, you ought to be striving to get better. Amen. When you get to heaven, you'll be perfect. You're not in heaven now. You're in the promised land if you're saved. <coughs> but in order to get the promised land, you have to go put your foot on the part that belongs to you. You have to go back and study the book. Is it Judges? Joshua and Judges. Study those two books. They're interesting books. Whole Bible is an interesting book. If you've never read it through, and of course I've been criticized for telling somebody to read it. Everybody ought to read their Bible through at least once, but I'm a, I have to qualify because I was corrected. Don't start in Genesis 1-1. Really, it's probably not best to start in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, because it's a genealogy. Maybe start in the Gospel of John and go on through the New Testament and then come back through Matthew, Mark, Luke and then go to the Old Testament. I don't know. I was a young preacher and I told people to read the Bible but I didn't tell them where to start. Well, I've been around a while now so now I'm trying to tell you where to start too. I messed up a lot. Have you ever messed up? No. Did Paul ever mess up? Yeah. Well, anyway, he says... If I, he says in verse uh, 12, and I've read it now, this would be what the third time my mother would be ashamed of me. She didn't like me repeat verses. But I think that's really how you learn them. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which before. Should we have a goal we're reaching for? What should your goal be? Real simple. Just be a better Christian. That's pretty broad. And I don't really don't know what that is for you. I don't know what that is for you. Uh, if people don't attend church regularly, I think part of it would be getting church regular. Yeah. If people don't read their Bible, I think they ought to start reading their Bible more. If they don't pray, they ought to start praying. That's right. <coughs> you know, the more you do something, usually the better you get at it. Isn't that the way it works? And Paul says, well, I haven't reached uh, maturity yet. I'm still growing as a Christian. And uh, if you study in Paul's life, sometimes he talked like as he got older, he still had a long ways to go. It's, it's kind of interesting, but yet we think about all Paul was able to do. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. There's some things we'll forget behind us. Uh, I don't know. I could. Ask, I don't know much about running races. Edward knows quite a bit about it. And we asked Edward. We said, "Now we've seen 13 point something, 26 point something. What's 0, 0.0?" And Edward told us. He says that's somebody that goes and pays the fee to enter a marathon. Then they go get their T-shirt, but then they don't run in the race. Well, we got a lot of Christians that are zero zero. Yes. Be nice to have some thirteen point milers, some twenty six milers, and then Edward talks about running like a hundred miles. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine it. But maybe I've run a hundred miles as a Christian because I've been at this for sixty years or so. And sometimes I don't. And then, and then I think, can you get a second wind, Edward? You get to a point where you say, I just feel like quitting. Those things get in training. And then that's something else Edwards told me. You've got to train. If you don't train, you won't get anywhere. I think coming to church is the training sessions. And then you ought to leave out of here and go do something. Don't you think? And uh, he says, I, verse 14, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So we're pressing toward the mark. We want to be more and more like Jesus. I think he was as good a Christian as you could find. Only perfect one. That's right. But he set us an example. And uh, I thought I ought to work on a sermon on the mind of Christ. And there I preached that. Well, what, how would Christ think? You just spend a little time studying that out. Good. I haven't gotten to it yet. Maybe I'll make it, maybe I won't. Just the thought that's come in my mind. Verse, uh, we read, what well, we're about to verse 15, six, 15 and 16 up in there. Let us therefore as many as may be perfect, be thou mindful, and if anything you, you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal unto us Reveal even this unto us. Well, one place he said we can be perfect, another place he said we can't. Wow, well, it contradicts itself. Well, it depends on what you mean by perfect. If you're perfect that you don't ever sin, ever do anything wrong, we'll never reach that in this life. But we can reach, okay, uh, we had a baby here for the first time she's ever been in church this morning. I don't even think she knows she's in church. She didn't know this. She was thinking that. Yeah, she was. She started out right, sleeping through services. <laughs> but anyway, what was I even going to say now? <laughs> but she's a perfect baby. I can't expect her to sit up like Joe over here and pay attention and not make any noise. I think I even heard her make some noise this morning 
as her voice and the wind gets better, she'll probably start making louder noises. I think Abigail and Rebecca are up to a little louder noises now. Huh? But they start out like Sarah. Well, we got to start somewhere, but don't stay where you're at. Be trying to grow and mature and develop and be a better Christian. Amen. And that's what Paul's saying here. No, you won't get in this life to perfection. That's one of the things I like about heaven. I get to heaven, I won't ever feel guilty. I won't keep looking back and the devil won't be able to keep reminding me of every time I ever messed up. Amen. He likes doing that to you. Accuser. He's accuser of the brethren, but Jesus is the defender of the brethren. And the Holy Spirit works in there too. And the Holy Spirit's stronger than the devil. But I'm going to tell you this. The devil is strong. Yeah. If you don't believe me, look around. Yeah. That's why the world's in the mess it's in. <laughs> is it or is it not the cause? Well, must be God because He created people with a will. and He knew they'd sin all along. But I think God's idea was you couldn't love God unless you had a free will. I think that's kind of the key to it. You'll have to think about it a little bit, but I, I think that's kind of what you're coming up with. But why does God keep me alive? Uh, am I really worth it? Those are the big questions, aren't they? Am I bearing fruit or just taking up space? Huh? Are you bearing fruit or just... Well, I, I look at some people and I think they're wasting their whole life. A lot of them don't work. A lot of them just want somebody else to take. But isn't the government kind of training people for that? Yeah, it's true. Several generations. Yesterday, and I already read that part to you, so I'm not going to go back uh, through that. But you know, I don't know about you. In verse 16, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule let us mind the same things. You know, we, we need to keep pressing toward the mark. Don't keep looking back. Another thing, if you keep looking back, you won't run as fast and you'll run crooked. That's right. It's good. Is that right, Edward? Yeah, yes. If I, if I keep looking back and thinking about that, that no, keep looking forward. Keep looking toward a, a, a goal and a you got to have your eyes on where you're going to go, not where you came from. But like Edward said, if you don't train, Amen. but once you get trained, we're trying to help train you in church. But you can train yourself too. Can't you read your Bible? You know, if you can read, you can learn almost anything. Amen. Except computers. I don't know about that. <laughs> There's some things to forget. I think your past failures. What well, ask God to forgive us? If we ask God to forgive us, the Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, then in uh, Paul's past life, you know, Paul could look at his past life. He persecuted Christians. Yeah. One of them get them all killed, put them in prison. You know, you reap what you sow. He became a Christian. They put him in prison. Yeah. Yeah. They persecuted him. Yeah. Even so Paul could have looked at his past life. Yeah. But God says, and don't keep looking back at the bad things. Ask God to forgive you. Repent. Repent. Didn't we already see that twice? If you don't repent, you're not going to heaven. If you don't repent, you're not going to be living for God better. And you need to repent as you go along. You can't just repent once and... Maybe that's why God repeated it in Luke 13. I had a fellow... He's, matter of fact, we started this church in his house. He's died now. I believe he's in heaven, but probably lost some reward. But I would go hunt him up. He thought... He'd rather go hunting and fishing than go to church. But I don't think he was out getting drunk or doing drugs or anything like that. 
I'd go get after him. He'd come back to the church. Then he'd come to the altar. He did that a few times, and I'd go get him again. He'd come back. Finally, he told me, he said, I'm getting tired of going to the altar. And, well, I don't think God ever got tired of it. How many times could you repent? Seven times 70? 490? That's what that amount to. Yeah. Get, the, get the mathematicians on that one. Seven times 70, 400. The idea is, so after that many times, you won't remember. Could you have, when you went come to get saved, could you have come to the altar and asked, listed off every sin you'd ever committed from the time you were born till then? Not a clue. But anything that God reveals to your heart that's wrong, you ought to ask God to forgive you for it and help you not to keep doing it. Amen. That's real repentance. Means you need to turn around. But God will forgive you. And I don't care if it's uh, 490 times or more. He's faithful. We need to be more faithful. We get more faithful by repenting and doing what God asks us to do. And uh, God promises that He'll forgive us. Uh, he said, I'll bury the, your sins in the depths of the sea. And that's in Micah 7.19. He said, I will separate them as far as the east is from the west. Now, how much farther can get apart east to west? It, 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 since the world's around you, just keep going. That's good. Uh -huh. It would always be east. One thing bothers me is up and down, north and south. I think heaven's north. I think it's up. But he says, I will separate them as far as the east from the west. That's Psalms 103, verse 12. Now, if Paul had dwelled on his past, he would have never started all those churches. He wouldn't have been used to give us uh, over half of the New Testament. He wouldn't have been used to go to the Gentiles. But he apparently didn't keep looking back. He was looking present toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, right? And that's what we should be trying to do. Just because you fail doesn't mean you ought to quit. No. Get up, repent and get up, and go on. Thomas Edison, I think it was around eight or nine hundred times, tried to find a way of making a light bulb. Well, what if he quit after 790 uh, and then and you could go on. Babe Ruth struck out more times than he hit home runs. But we don't think about all the strikeouts. We think about how many home runs he hit. Shouldn't we think, if the Lord's helped us to succeed somewhere, shouldn't we be thanking God for that? Another thing I think, what well, to our, forget our grievances. Don't major on your feelings. Somebody hurt my feelings. Well, I imagine they hurt Jesus' feelings. Well, I know they did. He, he cried out to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, he said, I would have gathered you like a mother hen, but you would not. And he tried his best to talk to the religious leaders. Apparently, a few of them got it. Amen. Thankfully. Maybe, you know, he Paul was one of them. Nicodemus, and who's the other guy? There's uh, Joseph, of Joseph of Arimathea. We know those. There might have been some others too that we don't know about. I think there were about seventy people in the Sanhedrin. Uh, How many? No, I think you're right. Richard. Around seventy, I think. But you know, really, instead of getting all caught up in our feelings, and somebody hurt our feelings, and sometimes we try to get even. Those are all bad things. Oh, you, you get to run around with your lips stuck out. <laughs> what good is it going to do you? Nothing. You might get sunburned. Your lip might get sunburned. <laughs> uh huh? 
Or, you know, your feelings on your sleeve. We use that too, don't we? Well, to just accept things that happen in course and go on. Just because something bad happens to you it doesn't mean you're righteous or wicked. It could just be that's what the way it works. But some people don't see it that way. We ought to forget ourselves. Some people, all they can think about is me. Me and mine. Well, you'll never do much for God if that Jesus didn't feel that way. Jesus didn't think that way. Paul didn't think that way. We could go all down through a, a long list of them. What about Peter? Of course, the Lord had work on Peter a little, and also Thomas. But didn't Thomas come back around and say, My Lord and my God, I don't have to touch the scars in your hands and your side. Didn't Peter, uh, wasn't he sorry for, uh, he said, uh, Jesus kept asking him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times and Peter kept saying, yes, I love you. But he was afraid to say with perfect love. But he said, I love you. Of course, you know, I think one day we'll have perfect love, but we'll be in heaven. But we can have more perfect love in this life if we're living for God than if we're not. We'll quit thinking about ourselves so much and think more about other people. I think families, most of the time families put the other members of the family before. I know a lot of mothers do. A lot of fathers do. I, I know my mom and dad sacrificed for me to have nice clothes and get what schooling I had. Although neither one of them had much schooling. And my mother used to, they used to make her clothes out of feed sacks on the farm down in Kentucky. But I think we ought to uh, forget about self. Another thing, I think we ought to pray more. Pray more. You know, Satan's getting more powerful and more powerful and taking over more and taking over more. Would you agree with me? Does it look like the devil's getting more, taking more ground or not? You need to pray more. Isn't that your power? The Holy Spirit and prayer are two of the... And the Word of God, those are your real strong weapons. The more you know about your Bible, the more you pray... Matter of fact, I think you ought to preach better. Somebody says, well, we're not preachers. You preach with your life. Yeah. Don't you? And any one of you can tell somebody how to get saved. If you've come to church here any length of time, you know the plan of salvation, don't you? Could you tell somebody else the plan of salvation? That's a form of preaching. That's absolutely right. In other words, preaching is your witness. Isn't it? You need the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to be able to witness. If you don't have both, nobody can get saved. The Holy Spirit's got to put conviction on people. You can quote all the verses you want to to them, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't make it real in their heart, it's not going to do any good. But if the Holy Spirit makes it real in their heart, they'll change. They'll get saved. Matter of fact, and then, and then somebody say, here you go, preacher. You ought to give more. Amen. Although our church is, we've been having more money come in than we've had come in in the history of this church in the last few years. I can show you the numbers. I'm not just talking off the top of my hat. I know what I'm talking about. I've been here for 50 years. <laughs> And I'm going to say this too, it hadn't always been easy. Even financially. But the church, the Lord is, you know, maybe the Lord feels like we're doing enough. He's keeping us alive for 50 years. Maybe we're not just taking up space. God's had some purpose or plan. But then I look at these churches with 7,000 people and I think, well, Lord, how come we don't have a lot more people? I don't know. It's not my place to try to figure. If I spend all my time figuring that up, we won't have any people. 
I keep looking back, that's not good. And when I say give more, I'm not just talking about money. Money is the least thing you can give, I feel like. Really, you give your life. The Bible talks about a drink offering. They'd take a liquid and pour it on a fire and it'd go up in smoke. Are you willing to pour yourself out for the Lord? Yeah. Say, well, nobody will see it. Well, I don't know. Maybe they'll see the smoke signal. But so what if they don't? The Lord knows, doesn't He? So why to give more money? Why to give more service? Why to read our Bibles more? We ought to pray more. Somebody says, oh, I don't know. I can't give my God much time. After all, I'm awful busy. Somebody says, well, what do you got to do? Well, I got to watch gun smoke. <laughs> Probably a lot of us spend too much time in front of the TV. True. Too much time in front of a telephone or a tablet or a computer. Now, I realize people have to go out and make a living. If Casey and doesn't put in so many hours a week or Edward, you can't pay your bills. You think God knows that? I'm sure he does. I think he'll give you allowance for that, don't you think? But maybe you could squeeze the Lord in a little bit. If you squeezed him in a little last year, maybe you could raise it a little more this year. Some people, they're one, one service a week people. <laughs> I'll come Sunday morning, but I can't come Sunday night. I can't come Wednesday night. And I don't know why. Sometimes I don't feel like coming Wednesday night, but I'm here. And then Casey comes and we don't even turn the radio on. He sits in the parking lot. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for that. But, uh, but we ought to read our Bible more. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and then I'm done. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Well, that's about all I had to say. Man. I took too much time in that middle part there. Guess I got off my nose too much. It's already seven or eight after. I was wanting to get done before the hour.